Thank you much for having me and glad to see everybody back into action. I think this one will advance the slides, yes. These are my disclosures, uh, but I don't have any commercial interest with any of these entities. So this is my agenda. I'll go over an introduction, then we'll talk about COVID and the transplant and the experience in the EMBMT area. So as you all know, the pandemic started in China in 2019, then was announced as a pandemic in uh, March 2020 by the WHO. Uh, here you see the number of cases accessed two weeks ago. So uh, worldwide, 364 million cases confirmed, uh, including 5 million deaths, 5.5 million deaths. So this is a huge number of deaths. And a total of 10 billion vaccine doses has been given. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, 671 cases, 671,000, so almost a million, and uh, uh, almost 9,000 deaths. So uh, definitely, uh, people with transplant will be affected because we have around 90,000 transplant carried out annually. You have 1.5 million post-transplant people living in the community. So these will capture COVID. And uh, as you know, the mortality in some subgroups was uh, reported to be high, like patients with comorbidity, hypertension, diabetes, elderly, pulmonary disease. So because of this increased mortality in specific groups, uh, attention was uh, brought to this special subgroup of immunosuppressed patients, the post-transplant patients. If you go to PubMed and uh, search for transplant and COVID, you get more than 6,000 articles. If you search for COVID and stem cell transplant, you see more than 800 articles. So this is a lot of articles during a brief period of time, which tells you that this entity is important. So this is the initial experience from Wuhan, China. As you see, the uh, severity rate is around 40% on uh, uh, the down graph. And then you see upstairs the comparison between no cancer patients, cancer survivors, and cancer, a patient with active cancer. And as you see, the severity and the death rates are much higher in survivors and in patients with active cancer as compared to patients without cancer. Uh, we did a meta-analysis uh, after a few months of the COVID. Uh, so we reported a mortality of 21.1% in cancer patients, the rate of severe disease 45%, intensive care unit admission 14.5%, mechanical ventilation around 12%, and all these numbers were much higher than non-cancer patients. Then the ASH did this collaborative COVID registry where you can go, any one of us can go and input his hematology patient with COVID. Uh, it doesn't have a large number of patients, but it's very informative. It has 1,158 patients with blood cancer and captured COVID. And as you see, they split, you know, the death is the red and the blue is recovered. Uh, yellow is unknown status. So they did multiple uh, subsets, as you see, per race, uh, per age, where the infections are, uh, age and mortality, comorbidities, smoking status. So a lot of good information can be seen there. And all in all, you see the red bar is constituting around 20-25% uh, of the mortality. So this is much higher than uh, the regular people. Here also you see the severity. Uh, and the death rate, the death rate is 17.5% all in all, the first graph. Uh, and uh, the severity is more than 50% have moderate to severe disease. They also report per neutrophil count uh, upon COVID, per lymphocyte count. Symptom-wise, it doesn't differ from uh, the normal people. So you see fever, cough, shortness of breath, and fatigue are the most commonly reported. Then they report the uh, treatment received by these patients, and it mirrors what's given in the community for other patients, azithromycin, chloroquines, remdesivir, and high-dose steroids were the most frequently uh, used drugs. In terms of the duration of symptoms, the, uh, the uh, median was 11 to 15 days in these people. So uh, with this, uh, uh, severe illness and uh, the, the, the history of uh, viral uh, uh, illnesses in transplant patients, uh, it was expected that transplant patients will have uh, a more severe course. 
Now, the first two cases reported from Wuhan, both died at 20 years old, 17 years old, both received haplo and died shortly uh, without mounting antibodies. So it was very alarming. However, some reporting bias probably exists because you would report these cases. Maybe if you get a transplant patient who recovered, you will not report. And then the solid organ transplant fatality rate was reported to be 28%. Uh, then other reports came about the persistently positive viral uh, 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 detection in patients with transplant. Whether these viruses were alive or dead, we did not know. But it was reported that these pa patients tend to shed the virus for a long time as compared to the others. <clears throat> then other groups started to report their experience. As you see here, this is from uh, the United States. 17-7 recipient. Uh, ALLO 35, AUTO 37, and CAR T cell 5. The median time from uh, cellular therapy to COVID was 782 days, so more than two years. Overall survival at day 30, 78%. So 22% of these patients died. This is very significant. And uh, uh, the number of comorbidities, uh, presence of infiltrates, and neutropenia upon presentation correlated with worst outcome. Then another study came from uh, uh, another institution, 367 adult and pediatric patients, uh, both uh, transplant and hematology patients. Uh, and as you see, there were 58 auto, 65 allo. The others are hematology. With a median age of 64, uh, the mortality rates in transplant patient was better, actually, as compared to non-transplant. So patient with active cancer uh, uh, do uh, worse as patients transplanted and already beyond uh, the transplant period. As you see, the mortality 31% in non-transplant hematology patients uh, as compared to 17 and 18% in transplanted patients. Uh, so the mortality in these patients was driven by older age, disease status, uh, remission or not, performance, as well as by uh, other immune parameters like neutrophils and the level of inflammation. Uh, CIBMTR shortly after that reported their experience, 318 patients, 184 ALLO, 134 auto, median time 17 months for ALLO, 23 months for auto, median age 47 for ALLO, 64 auto, and as you see, half had mild disease, the others had a moderate uh, to a severe illness. Mechanical ventilation, 14% of patients needed that. And overall survival, as you see, 68% for ALO, 67% for auto. So this is around 33% uh, uh, death rate uh, in this population. And they reported that male sex, age, uh, COVID within 12 months of transplant had the higher uh, rates of mortality among others. Lymphoma people in the auto transplant, lymphoma had more mortality, and this is probably reflecting the use of anti-CD20 in these patients and the lymphodepletion uh, that result from that. Absolute lymph lymphocyte count more, uh, less than 0 0.3 uh, at COVID was associated with uh, worst survival as well. Now, the others, race, ethnicity, comorbidity in index, and immunosuppression did not correlate with the increased mortality. We did uh, uh, report our experience from uh, uh, the Gulf countries. So this is a collaborative effort. Uh, many of you collaborated with us on that. And as you see, we collected 91 patients. Uh, the median age was 35, so much younger than what's reported from the West. Median time from transplant to COVID was around 15 months. 48 only had uh, comorbidities, and most of them had one comorbidity, like hypertension, diabetes. So less comorbidities in our population, younger age 35. 57 allo, 43% auto. Majority were myeloablative, and the majority were in remission when they captured the COVID. So as you see, 86% had symptoms, 50% mild, and the others are moderate to severe, so reflecting the prior experience. 53% needed admission to the hospital, 30%, 31% went to ICU, 33% needed oxygen, and 10% needed mechanical ventilation. Our mortality was 4.4%. This is much lower than others, and it is assumed because of the young age and because of uh, the uh, low number of comorbidities. 
also possibly because the healthcare system in the Gulf area was not overwhelmed like in other countries with the big spikes of COVID. So maybe these patients were cared for in uh, tertiary and quaternary care centers rather uh, than uh, the others. And as you see, the thrombosis was uh, one patient on the acute uh, kidney injury, 10%. Now, uh, 66 patients had repeated PCRs, and 51% of them, 51 over 66, so two-thirds turned negative. The median time to turn negative was 37 days. So this can tell you about shedding uh, the virus in these people. It takes longer than normal, so 37 days. Uh, about antibodies, developing antibodies, also two-thirds developed antibodies at a median of uh, 34 days. So it was a very informative uh, uh, collection of patients. And here you see the impact of different factors on the outcomes, like we did the age, BMI, comorbidities, underlying disease, disease status, all this type of uh, risk factors, and their impact on mortality, admission, ICU admission, oxygen, mechanical ventilation. And we only found that the time from transplant to COVID is associated with uh, worst outcome. So a time, uh, if the patient gets COVID within six months of transplant, their outcome is expected to be worse. Uh, this is another uh, meta-analysis. This was reported uh, recently. The nice thing about it, it's a big collection of patients. So 2,000 patients with COVID, median age 57, uh, median time uh, to capture the infection 23 months uh, after O216 after ALLO. And the mortality rate was 19%. So this tells you the exact mortality, mortality rate of a transplant patient because it has a very big collection, 2,000 patients. Now, in auto, if you split it, in auto patient, it's 17%. In allo patient, it's 21%. So a little higher in allo patients. Now, how about with CAR T cell? You know, CAR T cell wipes out the lymphocytes. And as such, these patients don't mount antibodies. And as you see, the mortality is 41%. So way much higher mortality rate as compared to transplant patients. Now, all in all, I collected these as you know, factors that correlate with uh, worst outcome in cellular therapy recipients. So age, active disease, time from transplant to COVID, comorbidities, absolute lymphocyte count, ANC at COVID, immunosuppression at COVID, and CAR T cell recipients. All these patients will have a worse outcome as compared to the others. So with that, you know, we started to modify our practice. A lot of you underwent the same in the community, physical distancing, limiting visitors, uh, negative pressure rooms for COVID positive, uh, special ward for COVID, physical distancing, environmental cleaning, and then the healthcare staff, daily screening, universal precautions, airborne droplet precautions, and for patient, universal screening, isolation, and telehealth for stable patients. So you all implemented all of this because of the reported higher mortality and complication rate. And then societies started to develop their guidelines on how to deal with these patients. As you see here, this is the TCT uh, guidelines. So patients and donors had some guidelines. For patients with positive PCR, you have to wait two weeks and the patient has to be asymptomatic and two negative PCR 24 hours apart to re restart your process of transplant. Now, this is subject to uh, exceptions uh, because, as you know, uh, clearing by PCR may lag behind uh, the, the symptoms. So you have to balance, you know, uh, the risk of your patient, the urgency of transplant with the PCR results. So it's not uh, mandatory, but it is recommended. If you have a patient in contact with COVID, okay, same applies. So two weeks, two negative PCR, 24 hours apart. For donors, you know the, the virus is detected in the blood of patients. So, but uh, the duration of viremia, how long it stays, we don't know. Transmission rate is unknown. This is a case of a patient who donated positive stem cell, okay, with no impact on the recipient. I will report a case uh, shortly in our hospital, Haplo, with positive donor. Uh, so we don't know the impact. Uh, but uh, in general, the TCT says donor with positive PCR are not eligible to donate. Uh, and uh, uh, you have to clear them. You have to wait 28 days 
uh, do PCR and make sure they're asymptomatic before you clear them. Uh, if possible, ensure alternative source is available. Uh, and uh, during the 28 days before donation, uh, these donors are uh, taught about uh, hygiene and uh, uh, practices to avoid uh, uh, COVID. Cryopreservation is recommended for donors, and we started to do that in our hospital with the COVID spikes. Now we're doing that with the Omicron. Uh, but for unrelated donors, uh, this is like a relative contraindication to freeze the, the cells of the unrelated donor because what if you don't use them later on? This is, and as you know, the donor uh, safety is a priority for uh, uh, registries. So uh, uh, this is problematic when you use unrelated patients. So this is a few cases just to, to give you the flavor of disruption that happens. This is a 21 years old CML transformed to ALL plant for haplo. So haplo, we do bone marrow collection. This is our program, okay? And his father, who is the donor, became febrile day zero, PCR positive. So we postponed the, the transplant one day trying to find another haplo. His sister, who is another haplo, haplo was febrile as well. So we did proceed with the donor. We used peripheral blood because the operating theater was not available for shortages and people uh, infected. And day five, the patient turns out PCR positive. We had to transfer him to a COVID, uh, COVID ward. So there, the nurses are not transplant. This is a haplo high risk transplant. Nurses are non-transplant. The MDs are non-transplant in that ward. We had to test all our transplant ward all the patients, sitters and staff, and any new neutropenic fever during that time we had to test for uh, COVID. So uh, very disruptive. He was treated and gladly he turned around, he engrafted and he's still alive, alhamdulillah. So, but he received tocilizumab twice and he developed uh, macrophage activation syndrome around the time of engraftment. He needed IVIG, dexa and ruxolotinib. Eventually his PCR became negative. This is another case, 44 years old, diffuse large, relapse in the CNS, so high risk relapse. Uh, two cycles of methotrexate RSE responded, third cycle with collection, fever, PCR positive. Okay, so this is day 12 when you want to collect. So we did the apheresis in the COVID war, despite a lot of uh, resistance. Uh, gladly the line was placed before admission because line placement was very problematic during that period as well. She collected, PCR was done on the collection and it was negative and converted back quickly to negative so she can be admitted in the transplant ward. She's transplanted, she's still alive, disease free, alhamdulillah. 21 days from the first PCR positive. Now this is a case, uh, unfortunate patient. So 67, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, relapse, salvage, then uh, PCR positive after second cycle, so before collection admitted with COVID B, recovered, persistently positive PCR and negative antibodies. So he was due for mobilization, denied access to the main hospital, denied line placement because his persistently positive PCR did not develop antibodies. So we had to admit him to the COVID ward after recovery, place a line, mobilize him, collect, despite being persistently positive, also denied to transplant ward. So we have to transplant him now He's collected, everything is ready, but he's still PCR positive. They denied his admission to the transplant ward and delayed, delayed, eventually became negative, admitted. Day two of beam, he developed hoarseness. So workup showed increase in the size of mediastinal nodes. So he got auto-transplant while progressing. He's in remission now. Unfortunately, last month he developed uh, AML, therapy-related AML. But he's in remission from his uh, disease and he survived all of this. So basically, very disruptive state, uh, staff shortage, physicians, nursing, patients testing positive, many staff working uh, extended hours. So we decided to stop transplant for hemoglobinopathies, myeloma, and any non-urgent transplant, we did delay it. Uh, general hospital precautions, of course, this applies to all hospital, restricting entry, screening all staff, no visitors. Uh, and for donors and patients, PCR has to be done one day before any procedure. Uh, we uh, did uh, peripheral blood for all our patients during that period, and now we're back to the same practice. 
So even for haplo, we are uh, cryopreserving now. And uh, uh, we limited the caretakers, you know, to one patient with no alternation. So, you know, allotransplant, they'll stay for 90 days in Riyadh, and we allowed only one patient, uh, one uh, uh, caregiver. Uh, a patient with terminal conditions inside the hospital were problematic. You know, families want to see them, to visit them, and we couldn't. Uh, and all of this was done in complex logistics, you know, lockdown, travel restriction. At one point, we didn't have personal protective equipment. We were short of uh, uh, gowns and uh, masks. Uh, plus, testing kits uh, were low. Uh, and all these new PCR methods had to be validated. So it was a pretty stressful uh, situation. Now, uh, uh, this, all these restrictions were reflected in this paper, which will come uh, out soon. Uh, so this is the uh, EBMT activity survey. This is done yearly since 1990. So since 1990, the EBMT reports their transplant activity, and it has been going up and up all this time for 30 years. The first time it dips was 2020. So all these restrictions were reflected in this activity with a decrease in the allo and autotransplantation. There was an increase in CAR T cell activity in that survey, and this is probably because this is a new therapy and people are adopting this new therapy. So in transplant pa patients, uh, there was a decrease in allo for non-malignant disease, like what happened in our practice, decrease in auto for autoimmune disease. These were statistically significant. Now, the more interesting thing, cord blood started to rise for the first time since 2012. And this is because MUDs were not available during this period. There was a severe shortage in MUDs because of the logistics, lockdowns, and uh, the infection. Uh, haplo as well, the use of haplo increased as compared to MUDs. So uh, the EBMT issued this uh, regarding uh, uh, vaccination. Uh, and as you see, they recommend vaccination uh, starting three months post the transplant if uh, the rate of infection is high in the community. I do it earlier if the rate is high. So basically, if the patient doesn't uh, benefit, uh, fine, but at least you offer some protection. Uh, and they made some exclusion like patient with GVHD, uh, patient with recent CD20 antibodies, CAR T cell patient with aplasia, ATG use, and the children. But these are guidelines, they are not mandatory. Uh, and uh, they say in that survey one that, uh, uh, one more slide. Uh, healthcare workers should be vaccinated to protect patients. Household contacts should be vaccination. And they said the positive antibody test doesn't mean protection. We don't know what's the protective title. Duration of protection is unknown. So this is a report of vaccinated transplant patients from French. Uh, all received Pfizer, uh, 687 patients. And as you see, the split between mud matched sibling and haplo. Uh, and what they said, uh, uh, they, they found that uh, uh, early vaccination is associated with uh, non-response, and that's basically transplant within 12 months and then vaccination. Uh, and people who received rituximab in the last six months did not respond well. Uh, Auto-response was higher than allo, 90% responded versus 80%, but the magnitude was higher in allo. Calcineurin decreased the rate of response, as you see, 56% uh, on immunosuppression responded. CAR T cell patient, we have three small studies, and as you see, the rate of response, 36, 21, 21%, so pretty low, and because these patients have wiped out lymphocytes, so they can't develop antibodies. Patient perception, this is a study, how did the patient feel? And basically, there was no difference from pre-transplant, post-transplant, uh, from pre-COVID, post-COVID in terms of depression, anxiety. I don't know if this is a cultural difference. I, I bet if this is done here, it'll show difference. Uh, so a lot of unanswered questions still. What's the aspergillus rate with these COVID? Uh, COVID outcomes per COVID variant uh, in transplant patient, we don't know. Outcome of vaccinated patients, so transplant vaccinated, what's their outcome? protective titers, different vaccines results, we only have Pfizer. Uh, and uh, the antibody-based therapy now is becoming popular, so we don't know its efficacy after the vaccination and its need, it's very expensive. 
Uh, COVID and the graft versus host disease, does it increase it, decrease it, uh, worsen the severity? We don't know. Interplay with other viruses. Transfusion from unknown status of the donors. We don't screen donors, you know, when we transfuse and all our patients receive transfusion. Uh, do you vaccinate if the patient was vaccinated before transplant? We don't know. And whether these recovered patients are at increased risk for post-transplant uh, cardiopulmonary complication and other complications, we don't know. So in summary, very disruptive. Every single aspect was affected. Recipient, donor, harvest, staff availability, drug interaction, GVHT, and diagnostic challenges. And as you know, these patients are diverse and in variable states of immunosuppression. So the outcome will be different. It's a new disease, a lot of anxiety with the new, and an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, now, vaccines, it seems that the mRNA vaccines are safe and immunocompromised according to CDC and recommended for everybody. With that, I'll finish, and thank you.